So the metaverse, uh, what is it? And I suppose the, the most important question, are we there yet? So that's what I hope to uh, talk to you about today. And, and to start that, would you believe that 15 years ago, 15 years ago, here at the World Knowledge Forum, I gave a talk on stage about the metaverse. The talk I gave was about Second Life, which is the virtual world that I had built. And I told everybody about many of the same things that we're talking about here today and, and at the forum now about the metaverse. At the time that I gave the talk, Second Life was growing incredibly rapidly. And a couple of years later, it reached a size of about a million people in, inside the virtual world of Second Life. And 15 years later, Second Life has actually been very successful as a company and as a business, but the size of the world is still about a, billion, a, a million people. It didn't grow to be everybody. And I was on stage saying that we would all be avatars and spend some of our life living as avatars in the virtual world. So what happened? Even though the Second Life has been very successful, it hasn't been for everybody. It stayed at that size. So that's part of what we'll talk about here. But first, let me, let me take you back to when I first heard the word uh, metaverse. It was 1992. I had just finished college. And for my birthday, my wife bought me this book that some of you probably know. The book was called Snow Crash. And it was the book where the word in fiction was first used, metaverse. And she said to me at the time, here's this book, science fiction, about that thing that you are always talking about. And so the metaverse, the idea of it, was something that I had at that point been thinking about for a long time, in fact, since I was a kid. So what was I thinking about, given that the book had just come out? Um, and I think it's interesting, when we when we hear the word metaverse, we think about things like gaming or e-commerce or, uh, you know, uh, uh, socialization. But the thing that I was dreaming about was a little bit different. Uh, when, I was, when I was a little kid, like so many other little kids, I wanted to be an astronaut and go into space and travel to new planets and find living things maybe on those planets. I was enamored with this idea. But, but I was also a very scientific kid. I ultimately ended up studying physics. And I learned about how the sun worked and how spaceships worked and how much energy it would take to go to Jupiter <laughs> or beyond. And in learning about that, I realized something, which was that it was going to be very difficult, you know, that, that, that even for somebody born when I had been born, to actually go into space and to actually go uh, travel to other worlds and meet other living things was going to be pretty difficult or maybe impossible. And around that same time, I was learning to program computers. I'm about a half a generation younger than Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, and so the computers were there for me, and I had access to them, but the internet was not there yet. But the early experiences that I had as a kid learning to program these early old computers, there were a couple of magical things that happened to me. One was, I don't know if you all remember those very beautiful fractal Mandelbro set fractals, and there, there used to be these pieces of software where you could zoom in. I don't know if you've done this before. You'd, you'd zoom in on a little picture of these beautiful fractal images, and then you would blow it up, and you'd zoom in again, and you'd zoom in again. You were kind of uh, exploring this, this mathematical coastline of mysterious shapes. And I remember doing that with my friend, and we zoomed in, and we zoomed in, and we zoomed in so many times that we ran out of computer power. We, we couldn't zoom in anymore. Uh, we'd reached the end. And at that point, we calculated, well, we had the little screen on our computer in front of us, and we calculated how big was the original image, the original mathematical image that we started from when we started zooming in. And we calculated that it was the size of the surface of Earth, that picture. And so I think, as a kid, I was, I was amazed by this idea that there could be such a big world inside the computer. That the, that the math or the computer could somehow create a big space. At the same time, I studied uh, stuff called cellular automata, the game of life, these 
uh, which was another way of simulating virtual worlds. And I was blown away by the idea that, that you could create this kind of inner space instead of outer space that was inside the computers. And so for me, that's what the metaverse was. It was the idea that I could somehow create a space that was on the computer that people could come together in and make things. And so that was, and, 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 li and live there. And that was, so that was the metaverse dream for me, a little different than uh, the other things that we often think about. Now today when we talk about the metaverse, let me suggest or frame something for you. That really that word today means two things that are very separable and they're both interesting. The first one is the transition of the internet from 2D to 3D. Most of the internet, of course, today is screens, and those screens are text and images. They're not three-dimensional. And yet, as human beings, there are many things that we can do better in 3D, whether it's shopping for something, or wandering around in an art gallery, or looking at the inside of an airplane engine, or whatever. There are many, many things that we do better in 3D, and our computers are becoming capable of doing 3D for us. And so that idea of transitioning a lot of our information experience of the internet from 2D to 3D is one thing. But the more important thing, and in my opinion, the thing that has much greater opportunity, risk, danger, potential, is not 2D to 3D. It's taking the internet from being lonely to being live. When you look, when you're on a website or using an app today, you're almost always alone with yourself looking. But there are typically many, many other people. If you're on a big website, there might be thousands of other people that are doing exactly the same thing as you right now, looking at exactly the same content. But you can't see or hear them. So imagine if the way the internet worked was that you could look to your left and look to your right and see the other people that were using the web page. Well, first of all, we're not there yet. I think people sometimes think we're sort of there yet, and the, the metaverse transaction has happened. It hasn't yet. So first of all, VR headsets, the Oculus Quest, which is the most popular one, they have not been successful yet. They're not getting used. Even though you've heard that there are, say, 10 million of these devices sold, you know, Facebook's uh, Oculus Quest is the most popular one, the number that, that you don't hear about is how many people are actually wearing them right now. And that's because that number is almost zero. Um, the, the VR headset, and I'll, get, I'll come back to this and talk about it is, un, it, is for a variety of reasons unusable at this point. So we don't have the hardware change that we need yet to make, th to make this stuff happen. The second one, and, and we really saw this with COVID, is that getting people together online is much, much harder than we thought. You know, I always say to people, do you remember after COVID started when you had like happy hour? with your friends at the end of the day, you did that once or twice and then you gave up because it was so bad. And, and, and doing things online in groups is much worse than one-on-one. -on -one. And so we're simply not there yet on creating social experiences online in any form that are comfortable yet. And then the third reason that we're not there yet at all is grown-ups versus kids. You're hearing about things like Minecraft uh, and, and Fortnite and Roblox and those things and, and things like uh, mus uh, you know, musical concerts that have been put on that 10 million people came to. But what we're forgetting is those 10 million people were all kids, typically between the age of 7 and 14. Nobody older than that uses virtual worlds or the metaverse yet. Second Life even as, smaller, as much smaller as it is than those systems, is still probably the largest online system where adults, people like us, are interacting with each other in virtual spaces. So why is that? But so, so we're, we're, we're just not there yet. So now let me talk about the why of that. Um, first of all, the hardware, the VR headsets. What's the problem? Well, the easy problem with the VR headsets is that they weigh too much. You can't wear them for more than about 20 or 30 minutes, and the reason for that is the weight on the bridge of your nose is too much. And so you can't have a meaningful social or entertainment experience because you can't wear one of these things for longer than 30 minutes. You can't have a business meeting. You also can't type, take notes, or answer your phone while you're wearing one of these things. 
So this is a non-starter. The most subtle problem with the headsets, though, and the one that I discovered at my company, High Fidelity, where we worked on this for 10 years, the last 10 years, is that the willingness to put on a VR headset is proportional to whether you feel safe being blindfolded in a room where there are probably other people. Now, nobody feels safe blindfolding themselves in a room with strangers. But the bigger problem is that different types of people feel much less safe than others. And so what happens is the VR headset is divisive and not inclusive. For example, women are less, much less likely to wear VR devices than men. And that means that any kind of a fair, open social environment can't be built yet. So the VR devices are there, it's hard, and I don't think we're going to be able to fix these problems, for example, with see-through cameras, with much, much lower weight, in, the, in less than the next five years or so. So it's going to be a while. And then you might say, what about AR? We can use AR devices, but the problem with AR is that it's, I think, even five years further out. Because with those devices, we have to have something incredibly light with batteries that last all day. But moreover, you have to be able to see the other person's eyes while they're using it so you can communicate normally. And an AR device can't see you the way that a, a VR tracking device can or if you're using a device with a desktop device or a laptop. So since the AR device can't see you, it can't animate you. And I'm going to come back to that because that's the big that's the big problem. That's one of the huge problems we have. So AR devices are even farther out. So we're five to 10 years away from the, the hardware being ready. But now let me talk about the software problems. Let me talk about three big software problems, which if you're entrepreneurs and you're interested in being in this space, this is the problems that you're going to have to fix, keep fixing. The first one, and it's what I touched on about adults, the great majority of us are not ready to be avatars yet. We're just not comfortable, particularly communicating with other people, particularly communicating with strangers as avatars. One of the things we noticed from Second Life was that the decision to become an avatar was a more serious and binary decision than I would ever have thought. When I was here last time telling you about this, I sort of was saying, everybody is going to have an avatar and you're going to live like part of your life in virtual worlds and the metaverse and then part of your life in the real world. I don't believe that anymore after 20 years of working on it. I think what happens is we tend to kind of really identify with one uh, avatar, right? And that avatar most typically is this one, <laughs> is our, our real life. And so switching over to another one is really difficult. The second thing is nonverbal cues. The information when we communicate with each other and the way that we communicate, particularly with people we don't know well, is very, very sophisticated. There's a lot of stuff that we're doing with our bodies when we communicate. And that information has to be conveyed over an online environment almost perfectly for us to be willing to use it. In fact, I would say that um, well, some, some examples are the shoulders. You know, how I turn my shoulders when I'm talking to somebody indicates whether I'm willing to let somebody else walk up and join me. So that's an example of a very subtle cue that you use your shoulders for. Another one is leaning forward and leaning back. In VR, we don't know where your hips are, so we don't know whether you're leaning forward or leaning back versus moving forward. That small difference is serious enough to keep you from wanting to have a conversation with somebody as an avatar. So nonverbal cues are a really big deal. Would you go to a meeting with your boss as an avatar? We've all seen those videos, for example, of Facebook's Horizons with Mark Zuckerberg, and you know they're in meetings. But ask yourself, would you go to a meeting with your boss using one of those systems where you couldn't see her nonverbal cues? I don't think you would. Some people will say, and some people say to me, and it's gotten funny when I hear it, oh, but the kids all want to be avatars. Generation Z, they all want to be avatars. And I see a lot of Generation Z people here, and I bet you're, oh, I can't see you because your masks are on, but behind them you're starting to smile already, right? I, I have four kids, uh, so I've gotten to see them all trying out all these different technologies. And the feeling I have is that the amount of misinformation and noise of the internet today makes Generation Z people actually more demanding of authenticity rather than less. 
younger people use things like Snapchat filters, but as, as you all know, they don't use them for communication. They use them for making asynchronous recordings. So I think that the, youngest, the younger generation, your gen many of your generation, is actually even more demanding about uh, information, nonverbal cues, body, authenticity, detail. So I think that's a, this is a really hard problem. So we, ha we have to get avatars working well enough for us to believe in them. The second thing is spatial audio. And this is something that I've worked at um, at my, my company, High Fidelity. Spatial audio is the ability to have two people talking to you at the same time, and you can understand them. The way that your brain does this is that when somebody's voice comes from a certain direction, your brain uses that direction as a kind of a help to enable it to listen to that person while there's still other sound going on. Sometimes we call this the cocktail party effect, if you've heard that expression. So spatial audio is a requirement for group interactions, and group interactions are what we need to make you know, the internet social. So you have to be able to hear multiple people talking at the same time. Um, that is a hard problem. It's mathematically difficult. It requires a lot of cloud compute in many cases to do it well. This is what I've done at my company. We've done it a long time and really well and carefully. Um, and most companies are not using it yet. So spatial audio is a necessary but not sufficient requirement for getting to uh, on online groups. Um, and it's tough. And microphones and problems of echo when there's, say, two people in the same actual room trying to be avatars make it even worse. The third problem is just scale. And what do I mean by that? Getting a lot of people in one place. Second Life can handle about 100 avatars in one event, or one place, you know, near each other. All of the other commercial software, the, the, the commercially available software that renders avatars together is about the same limit, is, is capable of something like 100, especially if the avatars are detailed enough to represent you like we were talking about earlier. So getting beyond 100 is, 100 is about where we are right now in software, and that's not enough. Most of the human experiences that we have together involve a lot of people. A music event, a freshman class, a political rally, uh, many of the things, that, a big company meeting, this, this, this gathering here. So we have to have a way to achieve scale. We have to have the software and the technology and the bandwidth to allow there to be a lot of people together in one place. You can't eliminate half your group from your meeting just to have it online. So this is a big problem. Barely works in Zoom, doesn't work at all with avatar environments and in 3D. So scale, avatars, and spatial audio. But, as I said, there's never been a time in human history when we've more needed to come together. There's never been a time. I mean, this is, this is a moment in history that we've, you know, that, that is terrifying in many ways. And the solution to it is to bring us all uh, closer to each other. So, looping back, I think that I, I encourage you, you know, if you're thinking about working on the metaverse, if you're thinking about starting a company around it, do it. Keep these thoughts in mind and go after this opportunity to do the thing that we were, I think we, we the people that were there at the beginning of the internet, we were right about the idea that, um, that the internet can be used for communication. It can be used to bring us together. And as I said before, things like Second Life show that that can be done without causing harm. It can be done allowing people to connect with each other and to form stronger bonds and to fall in love and go to school together and, 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 and you know, make new friends and do all the things that we do in the real world but online. So keep working on that. It's, a, it's the right mission to work on. It's hard. There's a lot of work to get there. And, uh, and I hope we can all do it together. So thank you very much. And I can take a few questions if anybody has questions too. It would be great.